Okay. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Moral Psychology with me, Dr. Josh Redstone. And today, we're going to be diving into our first lecture from your textbook, and we're going to be looking at Chapter 1, The Evolution of Morality, by Edward Mashery and Ron Mallon. All right, so this chapter uh, deals with several versions of the claim uh, made by uh, evolutionary psychologists and philosophers alike that morality is the product of evolution or that morality has evolved. So let's get right into it. Now, to quote from this first chapter on page three of your textbook, many thinkers concur on the provocative claim that morality is an evolved part of human nature, much like a tendency to weave nets is an evolved part of spider's nature. Um, and the authors of this chapter break these ways down um, in order to, I guess, more easily evaluate the different versions of this claim. Uh, the motivations behind their project are to do with the fact that a lot of uh, moral philosophers uh, in, the, in the moral philosophy literature have recently tried to justify the existence of specific norms uh, by appealing to the fact, if it is indeed a fact, that morality has evolved. So perhaps those specific norms have evolved themselves. That's one way to look at, the, uh, at this, but of course the claim that morality has evolved has also been treated with skepticism by some philosophers as well. Now, <clears throat> whichever way you look at it, obviously this claim, morality has evolved, is a very, very general statement, and there are a number of different ways in which this can be understood. And the authors of this uh, chapter of the textbook, Mashery and Mallon, write that, that this claim can be um, formulated in three different ways, or perhaps more, but in any case, they treat uh, these three different formulations as the subject of their um, assessments in this chapter. Two of the ways of interpreting the claim that morality has evolved, they will argue in this chapter, um, are probably empirically supported, but they don't actually offer very much of a philosophical payoff. So um, it's uncontroversial, as we'll see, when it comes to the two for first formulations of the claim that morality has evolved, that uh, morality has in fact evolved in, evolved in one way or another. That's not uh, controversial, shouldn't come as a surprise to anybody, but if you're a moral philosopher um, looking for a big philosophical payoff from this fact, you're going to be a little disappointed. The third uh, formulation of this claim, the authors suggest, offers the greatest philosophical payoff or the greatest uh, prospects for a philosophical payoff, but unlike the first two formulations, is not well empirically supported. The three versions of this claim, uh, or three formulations of this claim that the authors look at in this chapter are, firstly, some components of moral psychology have evolved. So that's the first formulation of this claim. Um, this is pretty uncontroversial, um, and we'll see why shortly, but it's difficult to demonstrate which particular components of moral psychology are the products of evolution, and if they are, whether they are adaptations or evolutionary accidents or spandrels or something like that. So that's the first formulation of this claim. The second formulation of this claim reads that normative cognition, that is, uh, the capacity to grasp norms and to make normative judgments has evolved. So we're talking about a specific kind of cognition that humans are capable of, do, uh, of doing. And that is what, is had, uh, what has evolved. Excuse me. Um, perhaps normative con cognition has evolved as an evolutionary adaptation again, or perhaps it's an evolutionary accident, or perhaps it... It's possible because of a number of other components that were evolved to do something else. Um, in any case, like the first claim, uh, this is empirically supported, um, but offers little philosophical payoff, according to the authors. And finally, the third formulation of the claim that morality has evolved is the claim that moral cognition, which is a special sort of normative cognition, has evolved. 
this would be really interesting for moral philosophers, um, and indeed for other types of thinkers like evolutionary psychologists, if it were the case. But the authors of this chapter are going to argue that the evidence for this third view, that is, that specific, uh, a specifically moral kind of cognition has evolved, is actually unsupported. All right. So that's it for the sort of summary of the three different formulations of this claim that morality has evolved. So why don't we break down the first one a little bit uh, and see what the authors think about this claim, why it's empirically supported, but why, on the other hand, it offers little in the way of philosophical payoffs. All right, so when it comes to this first claim um, that... Um, components of moral psychology have evolved, well, that's pretty uncontroversial, right, Mashery and Malin. It's not controversial at all to suppose that some elements for moral psychology are the products of evolution. Uh, for example, emotions are arguably something that have evolved in human beings and probably in other non-human animals as well, and this is something that's been noted since the time of Darwin. Darwin himself wrote um, a very interesting book called The Expression of the Emotions in Man and in Animals, which dealt with what, uh, what emotions are for, evolutionarily speaking, in uh, different sorts of animals and, of course, in human beings. Um, moral cognition probably also depends on a number of other kinds of cognition, if you want to put it that way, like uh, many aspects of social, cog social cognition. So uh, remembering the faces of conspecifics, of in-group members and out-group members, remembering who's um, a cheater and who follows the rules, uh, these kinds of things. Um, mind reading is a big one, working out what uh, people are thinking, um, what people believe, or what people think about what you're thinking. Um, all of these are involved in some way or another, as we'll see as this course unfolds, in our moral psychology. And it's very uncontroversial to say that these capacities evolved. Um, but what is difficult to do is show that a specific component of our moral psychology has evolved. So um, this ultimately is the reason why we get little philosophical payoff from, from this very general version of this claim that some components of moral psychology have evolved. Ultimately, it's because it's difficult to tell which ones. Um, and the example, or before we get to the example, uh, rather, the reason why um, it's difficult to work out um, which components of moral psychology might be the products of evolution um, has to do with the difficulty in establishing which of our moral psychological traits are good candidates for actually being evolved traits. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about something called a homologue here. That'll help clarify this. The uh, authors of this chapter of the textbook discuss this as well. Um, so what is a homologue? Well, uh, a homologue is an evolutionary trait um, uh, that exists in, I suppose you could call them, two ancestor species uh, that have evolved from a common ancestor. So uh, the eye of a chimpanzee and the eye of a human being are homologues because they have both descended from the eyes of the uh, common ancestor of humans and chimpanzees. Uh, likewise, our hands are homologues with bat's wings, even though they look very different, um, the structure of the bones in our hands and stuff, uh, the way it's all ended up being now with our cool fingers and opposable thumbs uh, that allow us to do cool stuff like, um, you know, create tools or uh, rock on the guitar. <laughs> something like that are homologous with the features of a bat's wing because if you go far back enough in evolutionary history there is a common uh, ancestor trait from which both um, human hands and bat's wings and lots of other mammalian appendages evolved from. So that's our 
Uh, that's what a homologue is, and um, it's supposed by some that some of our human moral traits might be homologues or homologous to moral traits in the great apes, for example. But before we can establish whether this is the case, of course, we have to try and be sure that the moral traits we're talking about here um, have indeed evolved. That is, we need to make sure they're not sociological or culturally uh, developed or cultural or sociological in origin as opposed to evolutionary in origin. <clears throat> so Franz de Waal's work is um, a pretty good illustration of this. Uh, that's why the authors of the textbook decide to talk about some of the studies that he's done with great apes and with monkeys. Um, now de Waal actually argues that the human sense of fairness is homologous to similar psychological systems, uh, or a, a, our sense of fairness is underwritten by psychological systems that have homologues in other primates. In some of his um, experiments with brown capuchin monkeys, he claims, shows evidence for this um, precursor to our sense of fairness system in brown capuchin monkeys. I'll show you a picture of uh, brown capuchin here. Um, right here. Nice. So the brown capuchin, or sometimes known as the tufted capuchin, is a new world monkey, which means it lives in the Americas, specifically it lives in South America. They're very social animals, and they're also very intelligent. Um, now, Brosnan and Duval have conducted a number of different experiments with these brown capuchins, and in these experiments, they're trained to exchange tokens uh, for rewards. So they'll get a token, which is like a little coin, and they have to uh, learn how to exchange it for a reward, which will be some kind of food. Then these two different capuchins are placed in two different cages, and they're given different rewards depending on the experimental condition. So the, uh, the uh, one capuchin will receive either the same or a different reward, for exchanging a token or for not exchanging a token, um, and the experimenters will measure the rate at which the reward is rejected um, by one of the capuchins. So, for example, refusing to exchange their token for a reward or throwing their reward or something like that, right? So the different conditions that we find in this experiment are uh, as follows. In the first condition, each capuchin gets a piece of cucumber when they exchange their coins. So both capuchins get the same reward, and it's just a slice of boring old cucumber. In the second condition, one capuchin receives a piece of cucumber for their token. The other capuchin receives a piece of a grape, a nice delicious grape, which the capuchins value um, more highly than the piece of cucumber. And in the third condition, one capuchin gets a piece of cucumber for exchanging their coin, and the other capuchin receives a piece of grape without having to exchange her coin. And that's the sort of, uh, I guess we could call it the unfairness condition. So what happens? Um, well, the results are pretty interesting. In the first condition, not much of anything happens. Um, the capuchins each get the same reward, and they don't reject it typically. So it seems as if, I suppose, the capuchins feel that this is perhaps a fair, uh, a fair sort of scenario. In the second condition, female cap capuchins will reject the piece of cucumber at a high rate if the second capuchin receives a piece of grape. So if we have two capuchins and one has to exchange a coin for a cucumber and the other has to exchange their coin for a grape, the capuchin that receives the cucumber um, will uh, become upset and reject the cucumber. The rejection rate of the cucumber is even higher in the third condition, where one capuchin receives a piece of grape um, without having to exchange their coin. Um, again, this is like the most unfair of these conditions, right? So that's pretty interesting, and um, Brosnan and Duvall use these results to argue that um, there may be some sort of evolutionary homologue within brown capuchins um, for a norm that governs the fair distribution of windfall gains, uh, a norm that we, human beings, are supposed to have. Otherwise, this wouldn't be homo homo homologous, right? So, 
Um, fair distribution of windfall gains. Well, firstly, just to clarify, what is a windfall gain? Well, a windfall gain is um, a, a sudden um, a sudden increase in resources or something like that, like winning the lottery. The name actually comes from if you're walking through an orchard, um, say an apple orchard, and all the fruits uh, are up high on the trees and you can't reach them. But all of a sudden, uh, a great wind blows through and all of the apples fall off the trees. Now all of a sudden you have all of the apples. That's a windfall gain, when you suddenly find yourself with a surplus of resources. Um, we're supposed to have a norm. At least this is what Brosnan and Duvall have in mind. We're supposed to have a norm that governs the fair distribution of these resources. So say I win the lottery, perhaps I have a norm that says it would be fair that I share those winnings with my friends and family or something like that, right? Well, um, perhaps um, the behavior of the capuchin monkeys in this experiment suggests that there is a homologue to this sort of norm in capuchins. But the authors of this textbook, Mashery and Malin, excuse me, the authors of the uh, chapter in this textbook are very skeptical of this. Um, now they don't deny, they're not denying that our sense of fairness might be something that has evolved. They're just not sure that uh, the results of Brosnan and Duvall's experiments actually show that such a norm, that is a norm for the fair distribution of windfall gains, actually exist in capuchins, nor that if such a norm does exist, that it has evolved. And the reason here is um, fairly straightforward. I mean, they point out, for example, that Brosnan and Duvall only observed this effect in female capuchins. Um, they did not observe it in male capuchins, which is interesting, um, because if it is an evolved trait, um, we should see it in both genders not just female capuchins. So that's strange. Moreover, when humans play games like the dictator game, which are sort of game theoretic uh, scenarios uh, where resources have to be distributed by a dictator to a number of subjects, males and females both will reject low offers, suggesting that um, well, in humans, both males and females get upset when windfall gains are not evenly distributed, unlike the capuchins uh, in Duvall's and Bronson's experiment, where only the females became upset. So, um, if this really is a homologue of a human norm, we should see it in male and female capuchins, and we don't, at least not in these experiments. And furthermore, as Henrik points out in a 2004 paper, humans behave very differently on the whole than female capuchins. Uh, typically, when humans are offered an unfair deal, um, we'll reject the offer if the rejection can hurt the one who offered the deal. But when rejection doesn't hurt the person who offered you the unfair deal, humans will tend to accept it, unlike the capuchins in conditions 2 and 3 of Brosnan and Duvall's experiment. Also, there's quite a bit of cultural variation um, in terms of um, what people expect the beneficiaries of windfall gains to do, um, at least with respect to the fair distribution of those gains. Um, Americans, for example, who have been surveyed, say that um, the fair distribution of windfall gains requires that those gains are divided equally, right? So perhaps if I win the lottery, I should give an equal share to all of my friends and family or something. Um, however, the Michigwenga people who live in South America have a different norm. They seem to expect the beneficiaries of windfall gains just to keep them for themselves. So if I have an unusually good um, uh, foraging trip, um, uh, thanks to the wind or other favorable conditions, perhaps. Um, you know, it's perfectly fair if I decide to keep those gains for, uh, myself. Um, it's not expected that I share it equally amongst my, uh, compatriots, right? Now, cross-cultural variation does not mean that a trait has not evolved. However, we need to keep in mind, as the authors of this chapter point out, that the common ancestor of both capuchins and humans lived probably around 30 million years ago. That's a long time ago. And if our fairness norms are that ancient, that is, if 
there are fairness norms in humans and in capuchins, and these norms have evolved from this common ancestor who also had fairness norms, they should be species typical. We shouldn't see such cultural variation or variation within or between genders, whether we're talking about humans or non-human animals here. So in this case, at least, the authors of the textbook suggest that cultural variation actually suggests that our sense of fairness is determined by culture-specific norms uh, and not by norms uh, that are really evolved traits. So Brosnan and Duvall, just to wrap it up, are interested in whether there are these um, um, homologous uh, moral traits in humans and other uh, great apes and monkeys. Um, in this case, they've been looking at norms about fairness, specifically fair distribution of windfall gains. But as the authors of this chapter have shown, before searching for these homologues, or at least before we can be sure that a candidate homologue is a particularly, um, well, a particularly interesting candidate for a component of moral cognition, uh, we have to be sure that there aren't any good reasons for doubting whether that trait has evolved. And in this case, um, the authors have shown, they claim, that there are good reasons to suspect that um, we, 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 we don't have the reasons we need to, uh, to be sure. We cannot be sure that this supposed homologue is actually a homologue. It, it is actually a trait that has evolved. Um, so the first interpretation of this claim, morality has evolved, is very uh, uncontroversial. We, we know that components of morality have probably evolved, such as our emotional systems uh, or something like that. Um, but when it comes to specific components of our moral psychology, like norms, um, which uh, govern, uh, you know, fairness norms, like the one that governs the fair distribution of windfall gains, um, and further, whether those norms are subserved by some sort of, um, you know, norm system in the mind that's specific to that uh, component of, of our moral psychology, uh, this is all very difficult to establish. So how about the second formulation of the claim, which is that normative cognition has evolved? Let's check that out right now. So researchers who pursue the possibility uh, that uh, normative cognition as a specific kind of cognition um, is something that has evolved. Um, treat it as though it is an adaptation. So I better explain precisely what an adaptation is. And adaptations are products of natural selection and adaptations increase fitness. And what fitness means here is not who's the biggest and strongest and fastest or something like that. Fitness in evolutionary biology refers to how many copies of your genes um, are out there in the gene pool. If you are a fitter individual, that basically means that you're better at getting copies of your genes out there into the gene pool. Um, so that's what adaptations are. They're the products of natural selection. Uh, they increase fitness, so on and so forth. Norms, specifically, um, since we're talking about normative cognition, uh, well, we talked a little bit about norms previously. Um, anything that's normative has that ought or ought not uh, kind of element to it. Um, the authors of this chapter talk about norms specifically as attitudes towards types of actions, emotions, thoughts, or other traits. And they always involve this kind of uh, deontic uh, content or rule-based content such as should, should not, ought, ought not, so on and so forth. So that's what adaptations are and that is what norms are. So moving forward, norms, the authors of this chapter state, are probably underwritten by a fairly complex cognitive architecture. Now a cognitive architecture is kind of like the architecture of the mind. Um, you can think of it that way. Um, here we're not so much talking about the kind of cognitive architecture we talk about in, say, like a computational modeling class, right? We're not talking about ACTAR or SOAR or anything like that. We're talking about the actual nuts and bolts of the, of the human mind. 
uh, when we're talking about cognitive architecture here. Now, um, why are these complex? Well, just to take an example, I mean, think, for example, of uh, the range of emotions you might feel um, when you uphold a norm or violate a norm, um, or when you observe somebody upholding or violating a norm. There's quite a range of emotions that might go into your reaction there, whether it's you or whether it's someone else we're talking about who's upholding or violating the norm. So this could get quite complex, um, suggesting that norms are un un underwritten by uh, a very complex architecture themselves, a very complex cognitive architecture. Now, um, Stitch and Sripada in a 2006 publication have argued that um, normative cognition is subserved by at least two distinct cognitive systems. So um, whatever our complex cognitive architecture is like here, uh, these two think there must be at least two components to it. And that is a, uh, an acquisition mechanism on the one hand, which allows us to acquire these norms and an implementation mechanism, which is what enables us to um, uphold norms, so on and so forth. <clears throat> So with an acquisition mechanism, I could learn, for example, the norms that are prevalent in my culture. The implementation mechanism would store representations of these norms, perhaps. It might produce desires in individuals to comply with those norms, um, or it might elicit motivations to punish norm violators. Um, so uh, Stitch and Srupada don't think that norms themselves are innate, they, but they do think that the mental machinery for understanding uh, norms, for acquiring them and implementing them, might be innate. But the norms themselves are actually something that's learned. Um, so let's get back to this core claim uh, that normative cognition is an adaptation. What exactly does that mean? Um, well, we've talked about what norms are specifically, and we've talked about what adaptations are specifically, but what does it mean to say that something has evolved? Well, there's actually two different versions of, of the claim X has evolved that the authors of this chapter discuss here. One is a weaker claim and one is a stronger claim. And the weaker claim is uh, just that a trait is evolved if it has a phylogenetic history, right? So if we can trace it back, um, in the fossil record or uh, by looking at genetics to determine common ancestry or whatever. This is the weaker claim, just to say that it has a phylogenetic history. The second claim is to claim that it is actually an adaptation. That is, it's the product of natural selection. So that's the stronger claim. So when we're asking about whether normative cognition has evolved, um, what we're asking is, is it an adaptation, right? Is it uh, something that has evolved to increase fitness? Or is it a byproduct of another adaptation? Or is it an evolutionary accident? Um, what's going on? We don't know. There's a few different ways to break this down. If we take the first way and we consider normative cognition an adaptation, then we need to identify its evolutionary function. So. Uh, we need to try to understand what drove its selection, whatever trait we're talking about, why was it selected for in our evolutionary past? All right, so when it comes to all of these questions, Mashri and Malon uh, consider a couple different lines of evidence. One is sociological and one is psychological. So we're going to start with the sociological lines of evidence after coffee. Now, norms, if we look at norms and we look at human society, um, we cannot find a human society without norms. When we look back in the historical record, all the way back to the dawn of history, um, we cannot find a society without norms. Norms are culturally universal or societally universal. All human societies have or have had norms. And um, there are a few different kinds of norms, too. There are informal norms and formal norms. Smaller societies tend to be regulated by informal norms, uh, and larger ones are regulated by a combination of formal and informal norms. So <clears throat> informal norms um, 
might be those that are enforced by informal mechanisms. So, for example, uh, gossip might be a, an informal mechanism for regulating norms. You know, if you've done, so, done something wrong and people are gossiping about you and word gets out, um, well, that's not very pleasant to be at the center of that kind of gossip, right? So you don't want to be gossiped about. Um, so um, you don't violate those norms. And that's precisely because there's an informal means of regulating uh, that kind of norm violation, right? But there's also more formal um, kinds of um, norm enforcement. Uh, and here I'm thinking of like the moral police. Uh, we see these in, for, for example, these kinds of organizations in Saudi Arabia or Iran um, that are there to actually make sure people are not just breaking the law, but that they're also um, adhering to the moral standards uh, that they ought to be adhering to, right? <clears throat> so the authors of this textbook take it as evidence, uh, take the, the antiquity of, of norms and the universality of norms as evidence that normative cognition is something that's evolved. I mean, when a trait is ancient and universal at the same time, um, that's evidence, uh, or, 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 or rather, <laughs> let me start over. If a trait is, uh, is ancient or universal at the same time, that's either because on the one hand, um, it's easily acquired through learning, either individual or social. So uh, beliefs like the sun rises every day. That's an easy belief to acquire just from your surroundings. We don't need any innate cognitive machinery to learn, uh, to learn that fact because we're just surrounded by rising and setting suns for our entire lives, right? Or, on the other hand, um, it's ancient and universal because um, there's an evolved developmental system that helps to ensure its development. So think here of language, right? Universal grammar, poverty of the stimulus, Noam Chomsky, you know, all of that stuff. Um, if, um, you know, language, uh, the, the stimuli we rely on to learn language are impoverished. Um, children learn language faster than they ought to be able to if they were learning it just by the stimuli, the linguistic stimuli that are there in their environment. So they must have some kind of innate mechanism that enables them to learn natural language, and that's universal grammar, as Noam Chomsky calls it. Perhaps there's an analogous cognitive system that subserves normative cognition. That's another way to understand this claim. Now, um, the authors don't really see how normative cognition could be acquired solely via social learning. Um, so they think that it's probably underwritten by this evolved normative cognition system. Um, but when it comes to uh, other psychological evidence, um, things get a little bit more fuzzy. Uh, for example, Lita Cosmetas and John Tooby have uh, put forward a, a by now very famous argument that people are more adept at reasoning about deontic conditionals than domain general conditionals. Um, deontic conditionals are conditionals involving rules. Um, so, you know, if you're under 19, do not drink alcohol, right? That's a deontic conditional. Uh, whereas something like modus tollens or modus ponens uh, is a, uh, not a deontic conditional. I have another video that explains these arguments, uh, which I'll link uh, around here somewhere, uh, just so that you can brush up on your modus, uh, modus tollens, for example, and modus ponens. Um, so when people do domain general versions of what's called the ways and selection task, where we have to validate a rule by turning over certain cards. People are actually very bad at doing this when it comes to domain general things like modus tollens, but they're very good at it um, by reasoning about, when they reason about deontic conditionals, even though um, the only thing that's changed is uh, the content of the test and not the actual logical rule that they have to validate when they do this test. The textbook is a little bit dry here, um, as I've indicated in my slides. So I'm going to find some examples of this so that rather than reading through all of the 
dry examples in this part of the textbook, you can actually try this yourself. So I'll have the ways and selection task up here and I'll have a domain general uh, version and a deontic version. And you can see how well you do at each one. You may be surprised uh, at, at how good or bad you are at this kind of reasoning. In any case, um, uh, Cosmetis and Tubi argue based on results of studies that uh, employ these kinds of tasks um, that we have uh, an evolved mental mechanism called a, mod a module uh, that deals with um, deontic conditionals and with uh, cheater detection. In fact, they call this the cheater detection module. And this is all related to something called the modularity of mind hypothesis and the massive the massive modularity hypothesis specifically, which is something we'll encounter again uh, as we proceed through the textbook and as we encounter um, more specifically evolutionarily psychological um, lines of thinking. So um, here we have this um, candidate for an evolved trait, normative cognition, and it has a certain functional specificity to it. It's cognition specifically for reasoning about norms, implementing, upholding norms, punishing norm violators, and that kind of thing. This trait develops early, according to the authors. Children show uh, similar performan uh, performance on selection tasks, like the ones I'm going to link to you, um, as adults do. Um, and, um, well, all of this to say that the authors think these are pretty compelling lines of evidence uh, suggesting that normative cognition has evolved and that it is, in fact, an adaptation. Uh, again, the philosophical payoff from this, though, is quite small. Um, it's really not that uncontroversial to say uh, that normative cognition is something that has evolved, um, but it's, it's difficult to know what specific components of it have evolved or whether normative cognition may just be another type of cognition that's maybe just a little bit more specialized. In any case, I'll leave it there with, with respect to this one, and we'll move on to uh, claim number three, or formulation of the claim morality has evolved number three, and that is that moral uh, normativity, a uh, specific kind of normative cognition has evolved. So let's start that now. All right, so those that argue for this third interpretation of the claim that morality has involved, um, they're talking about a specific kind of normative cognition, and that is, of course, moral cognition or morality. Um, so basically, the, the project of these researchers is to argue for the evolution of the specific kind of normative cognition. Now, keep in mind, before we get into this, but there are many, many, many kinds of normative judgments. Not all of them are moral judgments, and it's not immediately clear um, what kinds of judgments are moral and what kinds are not. So I've got a uh, list of possible moral judgments in the slides. So we've got you shouldn't wear socks with sandals. Uh, you should always wear your seatbelt. That's another one. You ought not to listen to polka music. Um, sounds like a pretty good norm. Uh, you mustn't hit other people, and you ought not to smoke cigarettes. So these are all norms. They're all normative judgments. Which ones are moral? Well, it's not exactly very straightforward. Um, you shouldn't wear socks with sandals, for example. I would argue certainly not a moral norm. Uh, this is something that we could call a conventional norm. It's just convention, perhaps, not to wear socks with sandals. Although, I suppose it depends on who you ask. Um, you, ought, ought, uh, you should always wear your seatbelt. Well, um, this one strikes me as a prudential norm. That is to say, um, it's simply a good idea to wear your seatbelt. Uh, you are violating the law by not wearing your seatbelt, but are you committing a moral wrong by not wearing a seatbelt? That's not immediately clear, but I think what is immediately clear is that it's just wise to wear one's seatbelt. So let's call that one a prudential norm. What about you ought not to listen to polka music? I have no idea. I guess it depends. Um, perhaps there are those who 
see polka as the work of the devil, similar to how um, some people um, used to feel that rock and roll or heavy metal um, were evil uh, music, or how some people uh, don't like rap music because of, of the uh, all of the sick rhymes about uh, crimes and, and, and things. Um, I don't really know what rappers rap about. Um, anyway, uh, you mustn't hit other people. Definitely a moral norm. Okay. Uh, I think we can all agree that that is patently obvious. What about you ought not to smoke cigarettes? Mm, that could be prudential, or it could be moral. I guess similar to you should always wear a seatbelt. Um, some people think it is simply prudent not to smoke, right? Smoking is bad for your health. Um, smoking causes all kinds of diseases. So it's just prudent not to take up smoking. But others would argue that this is also a moral norm. Uh, for example, um, if, uh, if a doctor's job um, is to um, alleviate pain and suffering and prevent death, uh, promote a healthy lifestyle, then perhaps um, it's, uh, it's a moral norm uh, that their doctor ought to recommend to their patients. That is, you ought not to smoke cigarettes. Uh, moral as well as prudential. Uh, then again, there are also certain um, religions that prohibit uh, smoking. Uh, for example, smoking is seen as something that is uh, or ought to be prohibited in uh, Islam, for example. Um, and there I would see that as uh, probably both a prudential and a moral norm. So all of this is to say it's not immediately clear uh, what norms are moral and what norms are conventional or prudential or other varieties of norms. Uh, or other kinds of norms, right? So we need some kind of criteria to establish what a moral norm is. We need criteria to distinguish moral norms from non-moral norms. And in his 2006 book, Richard Joyce provides seven uh, kinds of characteristics or properties that he thinks distinguishes moral norms from non-moral norms. Um, so in Joyce's view, Moral norms, uh, firstly, are ways of expressing cognitive attitudes, like approval or contempt, um, and beliefs, as well as attitudes. Uh, secondly, um, <clears throat> uh, moral norms are deliberative co uh, considerations, irrespective of the interests of those whom they are expressed. So they're not meant to be advice. Um, they're meant to be rules, they're meant to be deontic, uh, where advice is perhaps just a bit more prudential, right? Uh, moral norms purport to be inescapable, whereas other kinds of norms do not. So moral norms uh, are supposed to govern what's right and wrong, and we're just supposed to be good and not do wrong things. So in that way, moral norms are supposed to be inescapable. Uh, they purport to transcend human conventions, so norms are not just conventional. They're supposed to hold regardless of convention, right? Uh, they govern interpersonal relations. Um, they're supposed to combat rampant individualism. You know, my, white, my right to wave your hand, to wave, oh, oh boy, I'm all mixed up. My right to wave my hand stops at your face, as the saying goes, right? Um, moral norms also imply notions of justice and desert, uh, moral desert. So that is reward and punishment for your good or bad deeds. Um, and they imply a moral conscience, uh, feelings of guilt or shame or other moral emotions that are supposed to regulate your moral conduct. <clears throat> so all of these things uh, for Richard Joyce, characterize moral norms, and these are what separate moral norms from other kinds of norms. Now, this is not meant to be a list of necessary and sufficient conditions. That's not the kind of project Joyce is uh, undertaking here. Rather, this is uh, a lot more like a cluster concept. So, as long as, um, to quote Joyce uh, from his book, uh, as long as a kind of value system satisfies enough of the above, then it counts as a moral system. Um, what enough of the above is, I'm not entirely certain of. And so this is kind of a fuzzy, I'm a, like it's a cluster concept. F cluster concepts tend to be a little bit more fuzzy than um, 
you know, uh, those concepts we understand uh, via necessity and sufficiency claims. Um, the classic view of concepts, we'll call that one. Um, anyway, this is a pretty rich account of uh, what morality, uh, what moral norms are, and that's going to become important in a moment. For now, um, uh, the authors, uh, Mashri and Malin, of this, uh, of this chapter, don't doubt that there is some kind of account on which, moral uh, on which moral normativity is something that has evolved. But um, they're skeptical of uh, whether they can say for certain whether something that's described as richly as Joyce has described um, moral norms um, can be a product of evolution. Um, so let's move on from that from now and look at morality specifically as an evolved trait. Remember, there are a couple of different ways we can think of normativity as having evolved, or moral normativity specifically. One way is just to say that it has a phylogenetic history, right? And the other way is to say that moral normativity is actually an adaptation. That is, it has evolved to fulfill a specific function. Now, Joyce thinks that this capacity for making moral judgments is a human adaptation, and he thinks that it's evolved to motivate us to act in pro-social ways. Pro-social just means in ways that benefit others uh, in our group and not just ourselves. So we'll, we'll instead of saying in, in good ways, we'll say pro-social ways because we're talking about an evolutionary account of morality here. This is opposed to... Um, behaving in antisocial ways, or perhaps just in egoistic ways. Um, <clears throat> we can also use language here, by the way, to signal our intent to act in pro-social ways uh, to other members of our, of our community. That's something that happens a lot nowadays um, on the internet. Um, in any case, um, Joyce also thinks that uh, these reliable pro-social behaviors and ways of signaling uh, one's intentions to act in pro-social ways um, were selected for because pro-social behaviors and this kind of signaling uh, were actually reciprocated by other members of our community, and, and that's why they were selected for. Mashri and Malin are a little bit skeptical of this. Um, they actually don't think that um, our ability to grasp distinctively moral norms, nor our capacity to make moral judgments, are things that have evolved. Uh, they use the analogy of playing chess, okay? The ability to play chess has not evolved, right? The ability to play chess depends on a number of, of evolved traits, certainly visual recognition of the pieces and of the chessboard and of the co configurations of the board, memorization, in this case of the rules of the game. These are all traits that have arguably evolved, but the capacity to play chess has not evolved. It is something that is learned. So uh, let's break down these different lines of argument uh, with respect to the, uh, the prospect of morality uh, being an evolved trait or having uh, having evolved. Um, uh, thinkers like Joyce uh, point out that there are these uh, models that are very plausible that can predict the selection of morality. Um, so that's one, uh, one piece of evidence that motivates the argument that um, moral cognition or morality is an evolved trait. Uh, and of course, the universality and innateness of our capacity to grasp these moral norms and to make moral judgments um, is evidence that morality is an evolved trait. So there are a couple different lines of evidence there. Um, let's look at reciprocal altruism, actually, because re reciprocal altruism is very interesting to consider here. Reciprocal altruism uh, is an idea that's been put forward by Robert Trivers. And basically, reciprocal, uh, reciprocal altruism is defined like this, where an individual has a gene, G, for an altruistic trait, T, and it's favored by natural selection. If T benefits discriminative, discriminative, blah, 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 discriminatively, recipients who are likely to reciprocate in the future. So um, let's say that we have an individual who has a gene, G, for sharing food, 
Now that gene will be favored by natural selection if the bearer of G shares food with individuals who are likely to reciprocate in the future in a way that increases the fitness of the bearer G. So that's reciprocal altruism. And this is in, in the text. Uh, if you need to go back and look this up, it's also in my slides if you want to uh, get a little bit more familiar with it. Now, um, there are also three conditions uh, that need to obtain uh, for reciprocal altruism to work. Um, the two, for the two individuals that are involved in the transaction, uh, for example, the cost of being altruistic, that is behaving um, in, in a sort of self-sacrificing, uh, benefit others at a cost to myself kind of way, must be lower than the benefit received from the reciprocator. And secondly, the benefit must be withheld from cheaters, so people that break the rules, take advantage, violate norms. And the individuals have to interact repeatedly. Otherwise, how could anything be reciprocated down the road if I only interact with you once and never again, right? Reciprocal altruism couldn't work if, if social interaction wasn't like this. So, on to the reasons to be skeptical. All right, so what are some reasons to be skeptical of this, at least this particular account of uh, morality um, as an evolved trait um, well, Mashri and Malon point out that um, there are cases where we benefit individuals with whom we have no further interaction, right? So in these pair, pairwise sort of altruistic interactions on, on reciprocal altruism uh, anyway, we're supposed to do this um, because down the road it will be reciprocated. But people do things like tipping well on holidays to people they'll never see again. So the authors feel that, well, this is kind of a reason to be skeptical. Although I would counter by saying, well, reciprocal beha or uh, altruistic behavior may not be reciprocated all of the time. But if we're primed to behave this way, then we're kind of already acting the way we need to um, before, well, uh, not before, but we're already acting in the na in the way we need to be in order for people who uh, with whom we do interact on a regular or semi regular basis uh, to reciprocate in the future. That said, a counterpoint to that would be that well, how did that behavior get selected for in the first place? If it's not being reciprocated and it's not increasing the fitness of the person who. Uh, does the first altruistic act that later gets reciprocated by a conspecific. Anyway, um, it isn't clear that reciprocal altruism can explain altruism uh, or can explain morality in the kinds of societies humans have lived in over the years, especially since because there's evidence to suggest that at least for the past 50,000 years or so, so we're talking pre-agricultural revolution, um, we've lived in Societies that weren't really all that small, societies could have ranged from a few hundred individuals up to um, several thousand individuals. And this doesn't necessarily mean that we were living in cities 50,000 years ago. Um, uh, in, in, even today, for example, uh, uh, Australian Aboriginal communities, uh, which are actually quite small and made up of perhaps a dozen or so members, um, are kind of strung together into these larger uh, like meta societies, I guess, if you want to call them. Um, and the point here is that in a society with a few hundred or a few thousand members, um, well, that society is going to be too large for us to remember who reciprocates and who is a cheater. And that's important um, when it comes to uh, behaving altruistically, right? We're not going to continuous, continuously behave altruistically towards a cheater. Um, but if society is so big that we can't keep track of who respects the rules and who doesn't, it's difficult um, for reciprocal altruism to work. A couple of further problems um, are that Trivers's model assumes that these kinds of interactions are pairwise. Um, but this need not always be the case. Uh, in fact, quite a lot of human social interactions um, occur between more than two people. Right? Um, so reciprocal altruism uh, doesn't cope with that very well. Reciprocal altruism is also supposed to explain evolutionary altruism. 
Uh, that is why would I make sacrifices? Uh, it's supposed to explain why I would make sacrifices to benefit those that are genetically related to me. Um, but a lot of moral norms don't have anything at all to do with altruism, either pro-social kinds of altruism or evolutionary altruism. Things like food taboos, right? It's hard to see how they uh, fit within uh, this whole idea of altruism. Uh, we also punish norm violators, but reciprocal altruism doesn't really talk about this. Um, reciprocal altruism just says that we should stop interacting with cheaters. Um, but of course, that's usually not what happens in large societies. Usually cheaters and norm violators are punished uh, for violating norms and for taking advantage of other people. Uh, and reciprocal altruism doesn't really have much to say about that. So, um, the first claim that there are plausible models which will predict the selection of morality or moral traits um, isn't really very well supported, at least when it comes to this reciprocal altruism stuff. But the second claim, uh, that the universality and innateness of our capacity to grasp moral norms and make moral judgments is evidence that morality is evolved to trait, well, we'll see how that one fares now. So the authors of the textbook here ask whether these moral norms, or whether any moral norms, are truly universal. Um, this would mean that not just every human culture has norms, that's uncontroversial, but that specifically moral norms, in the sense that, for example, Joyce is talking about, are in fact universal. Now the authors point out that this is often just bluntly asserted by uh, researchers in this area without actually being uh, given uh, substantive evidence, uh, which is pretty problematic for that claim. So thinkers like Joyce, uh, Mashri and Malon claim, do not do a very good job of distinguishing between norms in general and, and moral norms. Um, they think, uh, Mashri and Malon that is, think that in a lot of cases thinkers like this um, are simply pointing to the existence of norms that appear to be normal, uh, rather than showing why these norms in fact count as moral norms in a, in a rigorous way. Um, so the authors of this chapter are not convinced that a lot of these thinkers who say that, you know, look at how universal these norms are, therefore they must be innate, therefore morality has evolved. Mashri and Malin think that a lot of the people who make this claim are not doing the work they need to, know, to do to show that those norms they're talking about are in fact moral norms. So an example which you can find on page 31 of your text in chapter 1 is that in the 6th century, uh, the Catholic Church used to prohibit people from being buried with their wealth. Um, being buried with wealth or hoarding wealth el elsewhere was kind of like a, a pagan thing to do, I suppose. Um, and the Catholic Church prohibited this and said, uh, moreover, that at least some of their wealth, up to about a third, uh, the deceased person actually should be donated to the church. Now, is this a moral norm? Well, maybe. It sounds like it could be a moral norm, but then again, it could also be a conventional norm, right? Perhaps it's just convention at the time um, that the church uh, thought that this was the way things ought to be done. Um, and they, it might have seemed normal because the church, um, an authority on moral matters at the time, said that this is the way you ought to do things. Uh, but what we need to do, really, to know for certain is establish that this norm possesses the kinds of properties um, of moral norms that distinguish those norms from just regular non-moral norms, right? Rather than doing this kind of work, Mashri and Malon claim, um, most people are just identifying norms in ancient cultures that are kind of similar superficially to modern norms, which uh, these uh, figures argue or, or think of uh, or view themselves as moral norms. What researchers should be doing, on the other hand, according to Mashri and Malon, is establishing that the norm uh, in question is a moral norm within the culture uh, or in the culture within which that norm holds. 
So we would need to, going back to this previous possible moral norm candidate, we'd have to establish whether that this norm of not burying yourself with your wealth and donating a third of your wealth to the church uh, when you die, um, we would have to see whether that functions as a moral norm in 6th century uh, European Christendom, right? But a lot of people don't do that. They simply say, here's a norm that sounds moral. That's a moral norm. Look how universal these kinds of norms are. Therefore, they are innate. Therefore, they must have evolved. So on and so forth. Another line of argument that's kind of related to this concerns the so-called moral and conventional distinction, and I've already talked a lot about moral norms here, and we've mentioned uh, conventional norms too. Um, moral norms are supposed to hold independently of authority, right? Uh, we do the right thing because it's the right thing, not because someone tells us to. They're also supposed to be universal, they're supposed to be uh, justified by things like uh, appeal to the harm that violating them does to other or to people's rights, and the violations of these norms are held to be serious. Conventional norms, on the other hand, depend on authority, they're locally applicable, and they're justified with an appeal to convention. And usually the violations of conventional norms are held to be less serious, right? So a conventional norm, again, might be something like uh, don't wear socks with sandals, um, don't eat with your elbows on the table, um, something like that, right? These are just conventions, uh, not actually moral norms. Now, some thinkers claim that across human cultures, we can observe that children are able to distinguish between uh, moral norms and conventional norms at a young age. Um, so some people take this as evidence that the capacity to make these kinds of moral judgments is innate, since we're able to distinguish between moral norms and non-moral norms at a young age. And of course, if this capacity is innate, then it must have evolved, right? Um, well, um, the evidence isn't actually that clear here, according to the authors of this chapter. Children, for example, are not as good at doing this as a lot of uh, thinkers have presumed. Um, indeed, sometimes uh, when we study this kind of thing, children making distinctions between conventional norms like don't eat with your elbows on the table and moral norms like don't hit other people, uh, they fail to distinguish between these as two different kinds of norms until they reach puberty. So that's uh, pretty interesting. Uh, if you compare that with our linguistic abilities, which are agreed by many, uh, cognitive scientists to be innate. That is the cognitive and perceptual machinery that allows us to learn natural languages at the speed that we do. Um, all of that occurs much earlier. I mean, granted, children are not the most sophisticated speakers, but generally they start speaking by around two years of age. And you can have a simple conversation with, uh, with a four-year-old, a five-year-old, um, um, so on and so forth, right? Uh, but up until uh, not being able to distinguish moral and conventional norms up until puberty, well, that suggests quite a different developmental trajectory. And perhaps I suspect the authors of this chapter would argue that um, uh, this is not as strong uh, of evidence of, of these abilities being innate as some thinkers suppose. So what about other kinds of developmental evidence? Well, um, remember when we talked about reasoning about deontic conditionals, um, people are better at reasoning about deontic conditionals than domain general conditionals like modus tollens or modus ponens. Um, might this imply that moral cognition is innate um, and therefore has evolved? Well, again, Mashery and Malin are skeptical about this. Um, this shows that normative con cognition has evolved. Uh, but it's unclear whether this counts as evidence for a specific kind of normative cognition having evolved, i.e. moral cognition. All right. We can also consider uh, other interesting cases. This is not really talked about in the textbook, so I won't really go into uh, too much detail here. Uh, but there is, of course, the question of empathy, right? Um, Empathy seems to be an innate capacity, um, and it is argued by some to be important uh, when it comes to moral cognition. 
Uh, let me see if I can find an example. Ah, so I have here an entire book about empathy and morality. Uh, this is by Heidi Maybaum, actually uh, the supervisor of my master's thesis. Uh, and in this book, there are a lot of collections edited together about uh, empathy's role in uh, regulating our moral behavior. And of course, certain, um, uh, certain, uh, certain uh, individuals such as psychopaths or narcissists who lack empathy often behave in ways that the rest of us consider to be morally in, uh, unacceptable, right? So um, if, empathy could be uh, an innate capacity, and those who lack empathy or are deficient in empathy seem to behave immorally. Um, so perhaps empathy is important for understanding right and wrong. Uh, then again, it could also be the case that empathy actually hinders moral reasoning in some cases. Think, for example, if I feel bad for... Um, a, um, a person who's begging for money on the street, who uh, is perhaps in very poor health, uh, has issues with substance abuse, um, they ask me for some change, perhaps I feel bad for them, so I give them some money. Um, but what happens if they do not spend that money on food? What if instead they use that money to purchase drugs, and those drugs um, could result in a fat fatal overdose? Well, in that case, uh, my empathy has led me to do the wrong thing. Um, so uh, see if you can come up with some other examples of empathy working or not working uh, well when it comes to uh, our moral cognition. Let me know in the comments section. All right, so to tie this all together, um, it's not clear when it comes to the third formulation of this claim that moral norms are indeed present in every culture. I think they probably are, but the authors of the textbook feel that thinkers that argue that haven't done the work they need to do to definitively show that that is the case. Um, there are also shortcomings uh, in the research on the development of children's capacities for uh, reasoning about the moral conventional distinction. Um, and other developmental lines of evidence certainly do support the idea that normative cognition has evolved, but not necessarily that moral cognition has evolved. So here, moral cognition might be like chess. Uh, it's something we can do as a result of other evolved traits, but it is not itself evolved. So to sum it all up, did morality evolve? Um, well, in one respect, yes, it did. Um, traits that are important for morality probably have evolved. Uh, but this is difficult to establish, uh, at least it's difficult to establish which particular traits um, are, have evolved. Uh, and that was the point of considering Brosnan and Duvall's work with capuchin monkeys, and uh, the question of whether there is a homologue for our sense of fairness in the brown capuchin. It's difficult to establish that those kinds of things are there. So while that claim is uncontroversial, uh, the payoff is kind of low, and it's difficult to establish what specific kinds of things are actually evolved traits. In another respect, uh, morality is a kind of normative cognition, and normative cognition has evolved, so uh, yeah, there's some evidence that uh, morality has evolved, but again, the payoff is quite low. No one here is suggesting that, uh, or at least no one who advocates this line of reasoning is suggesting that morality itself has evolved, just that um, it has evolved, but as a, as a kind of a more general type of cognition, uh, reasoning about norms, which has evolved. And in the third respect, it's not quite conclusive whether morality has evolved. That is whether moral cognition proper has evolved. Um, we can't really rule out whether this is sociocultural or not at this stage. And unfortunately, this is the one that would really offer the most philosophical payoff uh, for a lot of folks who are interested in this kind of thing, right? Um, so, what are some of the implications of all of this for moral philosophy? Um, well, um, the idea that morality is something that has evolved features heavily in some philosophical arguments that attempt to justify specific moral norms, um, or also in skeptical arguments about morality. Now, the authors don't think the first two formulations yield the philosophical payoffs that uh, philosophers really want. That is the first two formulations of uh, this, this claim that morality has evolved. 
It's, they're probably both true, but we don't get the payoff we want from them. Uh, the final formulation might offer a significant philosophical payoff, but, but it's not empirically well supported, according to the authors of this chapter. And with that said, that about does it for my walkthrough of this chapter. Now, I know that was very dense. Um, I hope that my, um, my lecture today has helped uh, draw your attention to what I think are particularly important uh, strands within this chapter. Um, and again, uh, I'll also make available um, some ways and selection task activity for you to do so that you can see um, how good you are about reasoning about deontic conditionals versus domain general conditionals. So that might be fun. Of course, if any of you have any questions, uh, do let me know in the comments section or send me an email. Or you can also now ask your questions in the discussion forums on See You Learn. I've created a little um, uh, thread there on, the, uh, on those forums where you can ask me particular questions. You can also ask your other classmates questions too. Um, talk about things amongst yourself. Oh, also office hours. Yes, uh, on Thursday, I will be holding office hours. Um, I've already made an announcement about this and it's possible that this video will be uploaded, uh, well, I'm going to try to upload it before the office hours, but chances are by the time you watch this, you may have already missed the first round of office hours. I don't know that I'm going to regularly hold them on Thursday. Uh, however, uh, that's what I'll be doing for this week, just to kind of see who shows up and what kind of questions they have. For next time, uh, we'll be looking at chapter two, multi-system moral psychology. This is a really fun chapter. We'll also encounter some neuroscience in this chapter in addition to psychology and philosophy. So that'll be a lot of fun. Oh my goodness. Wow. We're also going to be um, encountering trolley problems again. For those of you who answered on the previous video, uh, answered in the comments section what you would do in those trolley scenarios, thank you very much. It's very interesting to see the variety of responses. Um, and I think in this next lecture, we're going to learn a lot about why some people make the judgments they make uh, in these different trolley scenarios. So that'll be a lot of fun. So that's it for now. Uh, again, any questions, email me. Let me know in the discussion board on See You Learn. Let me know in the comment section. I hope you're all staying safe and healthy out there. And I'll see you guys next time. Bye for now.